Hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar. I'm Lisa Mayer, WeedSmart Manager. Today we are talking about how to make the right decision on using Group G's in the Southern Cropping System. We've invited Chris Preston along with my WeedSmart colleague and South Australia Extension Specialist, Chris Davey, to lead this discussion today. Welcome gentlemen. Before we start the webinar, I want to give you a quick summary of WeedSmart. WeedSmart exists as a result of GRDC funding together with funding from our industry partners. Our purpose is to communicate science-backed solutions to keep herbicides and seed traits sustainable. Our financial partners are all those listed above the orange line. We also are grateful to have in-kind support from major consultancy companies, as well as partnerships with each of the university-led weed research teams. Today's webinar is the result of WeedSmart's partnership with the University of Adelaide and Dr. Chris Preston. In saying that, I'll hand over to Chris Davey, who will introduce Chris Preston for us. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Chris is going to present his thoughts on how new and existing Group G products can be best utilised in our southern cropping systems. A real uh, interesting um, uh, topic that we've got today, Chris. Uh, so thank you for your time and your expertise. And I'll uh, hand it over to you to run us through the webinar. Okay, thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, so I think the perhaps the thing that we're um, be thinking about at the moment is that um, Group G herbicide chemistry has suddenly become a lot more complicated for us, um, particularly in the agronomy space than it used to be. I mean, once upon a time, it was pretty simple. We had spikes, we had affinity, and that was pretty much it. Um, now we're starting to look at a range of new molecules and a range of new uh, use patterns. So these Group G herbicides are a specific group. They inhibit a um, particular enzyme. It's got a really long name, but I'm just going to call it PPO uh, for short. So what we're be interested in um, dealing with these is sort of, you know, how do we use them? Where do they fit? And what's the best choice to make about some of these herbicides? So I'm going to start off with a um, just a, a, if things work on this end. There we go. I'm going to start off with a, a bit of a listing of the, of the various herbicides that we've got into play um, about Group Gs. Now, some of these aren't registered yet, but they'll be coming in the next year or so. And talking about the, um, the use pattern. So all I've done here is I've just simply divided the, the season up into some use patterns. So we have, you know, those spikes that we'd use um, with, typically with glyphosate, um, pre-sowing. Um, we've got the opportunity of having a pre-sowing residual we got some in-crop uses, we got some late crop uses, and indeed there's some fence line uses. So if we look through the, the herbicides that we currently have, um, you've got, you know, oxyfluor, that's a typo there, that should be oxyfluorphen uh, and butafenacil, which we've had for a while, um, that really only have the use at the moment for us as a spike. Uh, New Farm's bringing uh, 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 tyophenacil or, or pteridor, uh, and that initially at least will be another spike product. Then we've got some herbicides that uh, we can use in more than one way. So if we look at uh, uh, cafentrazone, which would be hammer as a spike or affinity force in crop and, and uh, pyrofluphenethyl or ecobar, we've got that opportunity of having that, that in crop usage uh, to control post-emergent weeds. And then we get more complicated. So fluming oxygen, which is terrain, you can use it as spike, you can put it down as a pre sowing residual. But we've also got a fence line um, use pattern for that um, particular herbicide. Uh, for cephalophenicil, it's sharpened, so as a, a standalone, um, it can be used as a spike, but we've also got these late or crop top um, use patterns. So pretty much when the when the crop is mature, um, using the herbicide there to um, control, uh, for example, seed set of wild radish or to remove um, weeds that are green in the crop um, before harvest. Uh, coming for us um, is uh, Fomosafem, which will be a reflex. And the initial use pattern we'll see for that is as a, a pre-sowing residual. Um, and I will 
add that what we might see with some of this chemistry as it goes along is getting more of these uses if they actually fit there. And then we got uh, Viraxel, which was registered this year, and that's got a use pattern as a, a spike, and it's got a use pattern as a, a pre sowing residual. So there's lots of complexity about how we might choose to use these herbicides. And often getting it right means picking the right herbicide for the right situation. So one of the things I do want to talk about, um, you know, just a, a bit of a brief um, chemistry lesson around um, the group G herbicides, because I think there's some new things that we actually haven't seen before or we haven't recognised really. Um, you know, and I've certainly, you know, grew up in the, um, in the year of playing with um, group G herbicides where, you know, it was really things like oxyfluorfin, so the gold, and we had a real um, idea about how that behaved, you know, it was very much a contact herbicide. Um, so you could use it as a spike as a contact herbicide, or if we put it out um, as we have some use patterns for as a um, residual herbicide, we were trying to create this um, surface seal and, and you couldn't break the surface seal or the weeds had come through. And the reason that it behaved that way is that it's actually got really low water solubility. So I've got the water solubility of a, a range of these products here in milligrams per litre. Um, and if you're less than one milligram per litre, you're pretty insoluble. And it's only when you're getting up, um, you know, to the, the thousand or to the grams per litre that we start talking about things that are really soluble. So we've got a range here from very insoluble to getting up into that, into that soluble range. So when we think about oxyfluorfin, it's not just about its solubility, that was a component of it, but it's also really lipophilic. And I've got a diagram over here about how lipophilic herbicides behave when they're put on the surface of the leaf. And so what we've got here is we've got that blue droplet sitting on top with our herbicide sitting in it. We've got the cuticular layer, and then you've got the epidermal cell. And the way products that are really lipophilic and insoluble work is that they get through that um, lipophilic layer quite well. And that gets driven by a concentration gradient, so high on the outside, low on the inside. But when they get to the other side and start meeting water, they're actually really don't like being in water very much. So they're not very soluble at that stage and they only kind of dribble out. So instead of kind of going through the cuticle and flooding out into the, um, that uh, space around the epidermal cell and into the cells, they kind of dribble out relatively slowly in that particular um, space there. And what that means is they don't move very much. They're not very water soluble. They're not gonna move around in that, in that tissue uh, inside the, the leaf. So they act as those really, really contact herbicides. And that's where we get that, that really classical um, golden spotting that we see with products like gold, um, where you get these, these depressions on the leaf, but they don't really all join up. And, you know, the herbicides at the top end of this chart tend to behave like that. So flumioxazin is a little bit more water soluble, but not very much. When we start getting down into the middle part of that. So we're starting to look at um, uh, carfentrazone ethyl, for example, it's got a little bit more water solubility. And so it's got a little bit more ability to move around. And there, what we tend to see is we tend to see sort of bigger spots because it does actually move around in the leaf. And when we get down right down to the bottom end, we're getting things that are quite water soluble. So they're going to move. They're actually not going to go through this pathway. It's probably the first thing to say. So saflofenacil is too water soluble to use this pathway. It's using a different pathway to get in. But once it gets in, it's water soluble enough to move around that leaf quite well. Um, whether they actually translocate widely is, so to other parts of the plant, is actually dependent on the specific chemistry, not just solubility. But you have to have solubility to translocate. So the ones at the top, not going to translocate at all because they just don't have solubility. The ones at the bottom, you're likely to see some more translocation, but how much depends on their chemistry. And it's not just about solubility at that stage. Now, the other thing to remember about this solubility bit is it also changes how we think about group G herbicides working in that surface. So if we're thinking about 
um, goal, so oxyfluorophen, or we're thinking about terrain, flimmy oxygen. We're thinking about creating that surface seal. And what we want to do with that surface seal is we want to have it continuous. So we tend to use pretty high rates to make sure we get a continuous surface seal. And what we're relying on is that as the weeds push up through that surface seal, they pick up these herbicides. And as they pick up these herbicides, then the herbicides will start working. They'll get that bleaching and the weeds will die. Now in those sort of situations, if you get a crack in that surface seal, so you drive across it, for example, then the weeds can escape because they can go up through the crack potentially and miss out on picking up any of that herbicide. When we start getting down towards the bottom end of this chart here, and so if we think about products like Fomasafen and, and Saflofenacil, they've actually got water solubility. So they're actually gonna move into that soil layer rather than sitting on the top. Now the process of the weeds picking them up is the same. They need to push up through that soil layer and pick up the herbicide. But now you've got a, an extended area where these herbicides can be picked up. And what that means is that it's harder for the weeds to escape them. So there's some benefits of having this solubility. And it means that some of these uh, residual products we're using are probably gonna be a, quite a bit more flexible about how we're using them than perhaps some of these old fashioned um, products that we'd had in the past. However, the other side of having water solubility is that the product, if it moves, it can be a problem, particularly if it gets washed into the, uh, where the crop is, and then we can get crop damage. So, you know, solubility is a bit of a two-edged sword for us in a residual um, herbicide context. So if we don't have enough crop safety, we'll end up with crop damage, because a lot of the time we're actually relying in some of our residual uses on separation rather than pure crop safety. So with that digression into chemistry, to give you a bit of a, um, a perhaps a bit of a background as to why I'm gonna say some of the things that I'm gonna say uh, about some of this chemistry, um, I think it's probably time to move on to think about, well, if we're gonna use this, how do we make the appropriate choices? So, Working in the spike space. So as I pointed out earlier on, um, that a lot of these herbicides, in fact, nearly all of them, we're gonna have a, um, a spike use pattern. So working in that spike space where we're adding it principally to glyphosate um, to try and um, increase the efficacy of that glyphosate. The big reason why we're bothering to put it in is because we actually have weeds in our system that glyphosate struggles on. Uh, you know, mallows, uh, erodium uh, are probably, you know, big ones that we think of. There's a few others that, of course, um, come up from time to time, and it all depends on where your farm is to which of these weeds are problematical for you. Um, so in that spike space, lots of choice. What do we worry about? Well, you know, number one, we worry about weed spectrum. So is our product we're gonna choose, is it actually effective against the key weeds that we've got the spike in there for? And so if you think about it, you know, um, there are probably a number of choices we could make uh, if, uh, if mallows are our, our major target weed, but you might just stick with hammer because it's cheap and it works. If fleabane's your main target weed, well, you're not gonna use hammer. And there you might go to sharpen, for example, because it'll work better. If you're thinking about grasses, of course you're not gonna use hammer because it doesn't really have any grass activity. And lots of the other products here have limited grass activity. So that you might then choose one of the products that has a bit more grass activity than the others. And so Sharpen has a little bit more than some of the others, but um, really the, the new New Farm products probably gonna be in the best space around grass activity in terms of how much it has. So Weed spectrum's really gonna be one of the things you're gonna be thinking about is no point you know, putting a spike in because it's, it's got other attributes that you might like if it doesn't actually control the weeds that you're after. I think the second one is about plant backs. And I think you need to you know, check labels about plant backs. For many of the products we've been used to using like Hammer, there's not really a plant back, so it's not a problem. Some of these um, newer ones, 
actually do have some plant backs. So Sharpen's got a plant back to canola, for example. And if you're thinking about using Braxa as a spike, you're only going to use that in front of cereals because you've got big plant backs to all the other crops. So plant backs is the other, the other part of this that you've really got to consider. And this is probably new in terms of thinking about how we're using these product as spikes. When we start looking at the residual space, we're going to be thinking about crop safety. It's probably going to be our number one concern. So what we've got in that residual space at the moment, we're really going to have three products. Um, so we've got um, terrain. Now we'd normally be looking at that, say for fava beans, or we could use it in cereals at a lower rate. Um, we've got uh, Varaxor, um, which we'll be only using it in cereals. And then we've got reflex, which we can use in the pulses. So that will be part of the decision making about which product in which um, crop. But also we've got to then understand how tolerant our various crops are and what the soil behaviour of these products are. So when we start thinking about how we're going to use these, two of the products I've talked about, so we're talking about um, Reflex and Veraxel, actually have quite a lot of water solubility within them. Within them. So Veraxel's got saflofenacil in it, for example, which is quite water soluble. We need to really worry about soil behaviour here. So we need to really be thinking about how we're going to get that crop safety. And the way we get that crop safety is we make sure we don't have product sitting on top of where the crop seed is. Because remember, the way these are working is that our crop's going to grow up or our weeds are going to grow up through the herbicide to get contacted. So for some of them where we've got good crop safety, yes, there'll be some PSPE applications. So you'll find some of those, for example, will turn up for some of the pulses on the reflex label. But um, probably, you know, for us, Chris, sitting here in South Australia, um, you know, the biggest issue we're going to have with that reflex uh, label is that lentils is the least tolerant of the uh, pulse crops. So we're going to be really wanting to try and tackle things like sow thistle and prickly lettuce in that lentil phase because we're really struggling with them and reflex would be a, a good opportunity for that but it's all going to have to be IBS. Um, there's not going to be any um, ability to play these you know funny games of putting the product out afterwards and um, you know because we won't get the safety. Again. Is it, is, sorry to interrupt, Chris. Is it fair yeah. to say um, some people have expressed maybe a little uh, concern of weed control in the furrow? Um, you know, they're saying excellent inter-row uh, group G residual, but, you know, they're worried about radish or similar coming up uh, in the row. But it's a real compromise or a real fine line between crop effect and uh, weed control. Yeah, look, I think, um, you know, it, it's a bit like the pre-emergent herbicide space, Chris, where, you know, we really have to make sure that we've got good crop safety. And if that means that we let a few weeds come up in the row, well, that might be what we've got to do and perhaps have other things available in our, in our armory of weed management to try and tackle those. So I think the idea of saying, oh, we're going to get some weeds up in the row, let's put some reflex out, post so pre emergent in lentils. Um, no, I don't think we're going to go there because there's going to be too much crop damage. So, you know, there, and I think, you know, I mean, I've talked about other, you know, in the, in the pre-emergent space, other herbicides we've got where we just don't play games with them. And I think Luxamax is a good example of that. You know, it's, it's IBS, it's nine points and press wheels, and we don't do anything else. And I think that that's what we're going to be putting up with in that lentil space. So, you know, it's going to be good, but it's not going to be perfect for us. If I um, put my uh, crop competition hat on, uh, you're exactly right. If you're going to upset the crop, um, you're not going to get that crop competition and therefore the weeds are going to have a free run anyway. Yeah. So we don't want to, we don't want to, you know, we don't want to ruin what our crop's doing um, by doing the wrong thing for weed control. And, you know, the, the same rules, will apply for Haraxa in cereals. We really want to keep that away from where the crop is. So we're looking at IBS um, and, you know, uh, I, the uh, nine point press wheel is going to be the system for use there. So 
you know, when we start planning how we're going to use these, we really need to stick to what's safe. And I think, uh, you know, we have enough trouble, uh, you know, to be really honest in our pulse phase, we have enough trouble growing good pulses without smashing them with herbicides. So we need to really get that bit right. So um, I suppose just um, to finish off um, the remarks I was going to say before we sort of turn it over to some um, questions, um, Chris, is, um, and this comes up a lot, you know, should we be worrying about resistance to group G herbicides? And um, the good news is that we actually don't have any in Australia at the moment. Um, it's one of the few modes of action that we actually don't have any resistance to. Uh, the reasons why are probably because the way we've actually used these herbicides over the years. Um, you know, most of our use has really been as, as mixtures in spikes. And when we're doing that prior to sowing, we're targeting a relatively small proportion of the total weed population. So we might have been pushing the weeds slowly towards resistance. And one of the things that we should concern ourselves with is that now that we've got all these other use patterns and probably are gonna be using some more group G herbicides to make sure that we don't actually drive that system to resistance. Um, this is a photograph from Arkansas. Uh, and that's um, group G resistant uh, Palmer amaranth in soybeans. Um, so, you know, we don't actually want to get, get there if we, can, if we can help it. So we do need to worry about um, resistance management with the group Gs. It's not a case that because we haven't had it, we're not going to get it. Um, it's probably going to be harder to get than some of the other um, resistances we've had, like the group B resistance. But, you know, I think it's proved with every herbicide that we've ever used. Um, if you work hard enough at it, you can get resistance. So it's something to be, um, be thoughtful of as you're starting to work out how you're going to use these in the, in the rotation. So um, reducing the risk, what have we got to worry about? Well, the standalone uses are the highest risk. And, uh, you know, if you're asking me to predict where resistance might happen first, um, I would go fence lines. You know, that would be the place where if we're going to see it first, that's where we might see it. Um, th that's probably the second place where I think increasingly we're going to be concerned about is when we're putting spikes in with glyphosate to try and manage glyphosate resistant weeds. Now, for some of these um, herbicides, uh, where perhaps we don't have very high levels of glyphosate resistance, just adding a spike rate of a group G might be enough because we're still getting some activity out of the glyphosate. But as time goes on and the population gets more resistant to glyphosate, all that pressure is going to go on to the, the group G component. So I think if, you know, if you're in a space where that's what's happening, you're primarily using these to try and tackle glyphosate resistant weeds, then you need to be concerned. What can we do? Well, you know, it's the same rules that we've got with a lot of the other herbicides that we're using. You know, we want to rotate herbicide modes of action between seasons as much as we can. And I know that, you know, for some of our crops that gets difficult because we don't have a lot of choices. Um, we want to use crop competition where it's a practical option. Um, so if we're looking at, you know, group G's in, in front of cereals or with cereals, we, you know, want to be looking to make sure we maintain that crop competition. And Chris has already talked about the importance of that. And I think most important, we want to be looking at how do we stop survivors setting seed? So, you know, what are the activities that we've got? And so, you know, certainly um, terrain is a fence line spray where you can't use some of the other options that we've come up with as fence line sprays. So where you don't want to use um, Uragan, for example, because you've got trees. It's fine. I mean, it, it works really well. Uh, and in our trial work, we've got, you know, really good residual out of it in that fence line space. Uh, but it's probably worthwhile just checking those fence lines and making sure that there's nothing growing there that shouldn't be growing there. Because in the early stages, they're really easy to get rid of. And they're easy to see on fence lines because it's bare. Uh, so, you know, we can do something early on with that fence line space. And I pointed that out as being the, probably the most risky um, option that we, we might have. As we move into some of these other spaces, well, we're starting to look at what are our opportunities of, of stopping seed set. 
So can we use other in-crop herbicides to control weeds that might've got through um, that spike application or might've got through the uh, residual application, uh, making sure we bring in our end of season tactics, so harvest weed seed control, crop topping tactics to the end of the season, uh, you know, bringing those in as well as part of the, part of the whole package to try and protect, protect the chemistry. So um, really, Chris, that was all I wanted to make sure I covered, um, but I'm, I think it's good we can get into some um, questions and answers now. Yeah, excellent. The, uh, the questions are starting to come through um, online as well as some that we've, uh, we've already uh, got here. So um, I'll, I'll just throw one at you uh, from my, uh, my group here, Chris. Um, in group A's, we've got FOPs, DIMS and, and DENS, for instance. Uh, is this the same with the five subgroups in group G? Um, are there subtle differences between the subgroups and we might be more prone to get resistance to one than the other? Um, well, I think the, the experience from North America, and this is where most of the experience of group G resistance is, um, is that a large proportion of what they're finding so far, but not everything, seems to be target site based. Um, but at the last count I had, I think there are five different target sites variants that you can have. So mutations in different places, as well as actually losing a whole um, amino acid in the protein. And there are some subtle differences amongst some of the group G um, herbicides in how they respond to some of those different um, target site mutations. So rather than saying it's like the FOP dim divide that we've seen, um, Chris, I think this is probably more like the group B space, where we have, um, you know, some mutations will just give us resistance to sulfonide ureas, and that's great, we can use image for a couple of years, but other mutations give us resistance across them. But we also have the situation where, you know, you might have quite high resistance to some of the group G herbicides, particularly in the, the diphenyl ether space. Um, but, you know, things like saflofenacil, um, you don't have as high level resistance, so you'll still get some activity out of it. So I think it's going to be quite complex and it depends on the type of resistance that we actually end up with. Yep. Um, I've got two here that have, have been recurring questions, Chris. Um, initially uh, on one of my Twitter posts where I asked for some questions for this afternoon and, and there's been another one come through since. Um, glypho versus paraquat as a, a partner with group G's. Um, what's your thoughts on that? and and should we be mixing it at all with glyphosate? Uh, look, I think it depends a bit on what you're trying to achieve, um, Chris. And, uh, you know, you can mix, you know, as spikes, we can have it in with either the glyphosate or paraquat. Um, and depends a bit on, on how that's actually going to play out in the system. And um, I've been, you know, considering that if we're thinking about glyphosate resistant weeds is really what we're going to try and tackle. Uh, and we're wanting to double knock, then the group G is probably better placed to put that in with the paraquat component rather than put it in the glyphosate component. Uh, but if you got it in there to get mallows, then you're probably better off having it in the glyphosate part, side of the equation rather than the paraquat side of the equation, um, because it'll probably be more effective there. Um, and I, then I think there's, there's, there's other issues that, that can come up as well. And so, you know, there can be growers who've got every intention of doing a double knock, um, but then something happens and the second application doesn't go out. And I think if you're sitting in a space where you've got, you know, you've got growers that are, are untrustworthy in that space in terms of they go, yeah, 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 I'll do it. But, you know, whatever happens, tends to happen often that they, they don't get around to it or something else happens. Um, you probably don't want to have it in the paraquat space because it won't go out. Uh, so you might want to then for those guys say, look, you're probably better at putting it up front. So it's, I reckon it's a real horses for courses. I like it if you're double knocking to put it in the paraquat, but yeah. I recognise that there are times where it's going to fit better with the glyphosate. Yep. And uh, look, that little uh, table that you put up was fantastic with solubility. In, in that sense, if you're going to put it with glypho uh, and you might take on board some antagonism and less grass control, would you favour something that is more soluble? like a, a sharpen? Um, 
Well, I think if you if you Putting them with the glypho and you're wanting to try and get some grass control, you'd use one of the products that's a bit better on grasses. So you'd be looking at the, the, the Sharpen or the Teradore, you know, probably for that. If, you know, if that's your own main aim. Um, you know, a lot of time our main aim is actually, you know, things like mallows and, and so on. And, and there you've got much more freedom there. Um, but you're right. I think if you're thinking that there might be some antagonism, you probably want to go with something that um, maybe not that's got more solubility per se, uh, but actually has more grass activity to make up for that. Yep. Uh, a couple of questions have come in also with group I. Um, yeah, is there synergies or antagonisms uh, mixing group G and group I? Um, look, I don't know a whole lot about that because we actually haven't done, you know, I mean, huge amounts other than we actually have these in-crop products where with carfentrazone for example where um or ecopar where we put the group eyes and there doesn't really seem to be a drama there um, but for some of these others it's probably a little bit unclear about how that works and what that's doing there but i don't know of any strong evidence saying that we're getting consistent synergy or antagonism with group eyes it seems to be one of those ones where uh, most of the time it just it just works you know you're getting this additive effect but there might be individual situations where that happens. We can't try, we can't look at everything. Yep. Uh, just another one here on online. Um, if we've used valor or terrain for residual in fallow, how does it make resistant sense to use a residual group G at sowing as well? Um, and, and that, you know, we, sorry to interrupt Chris, like when, when you look at where the group G's fit, again, we've got summer weed spikes, we've, you've mentioned fence lines, we've got knockdowns, we've got pre-ems in cereals and pulses, we've got post-em in pulses and cereal and pastures. So literally there can be multiple, or we are at risk of having multiple group G's going out throughout any given year. Yeah, so so this is something I think a bit, um, it really depends a bit on weeds you're chasing, um, situation you're in. I think here in the south, we've got less to worry about this perhaps than in the north. Um, because most of our weeds, we only get one generation a year, whether they're summer weeds or winter weeds. Um, we rarely get a second generation of either one. So we're starting to look at how we're doing it. We're putting out a summer um, spike spray. Um, we don't actually have any winter weeds up. It's not doing anything for selection. So we're worried then about what we're doing in the season. But I think that all of the, um, you know, all of the ways that you actually think about how we're selecting weeds for resistance, what happens is when we use more than one application of a mode of action within a year, what we tend to do is just select more of that population that was up at that time. So instead of getting, you know, 70%, we might shift that up to 80 or 90 or whatever percent. And that increases selection, but it doesn't increase selection as much as if we use it every year. So I'd be a bit less concerned about us putting out a spike out of summer and then using a, um, a residual later, um, provided we're going to have enough crop safety with that, um, or even using a spike and then an in-crop spray. I'm less concerned about that than I am concerned about the fact that people might get into the habit of having a group G go out every year. I think if you're starting to look at your you know, systems and you're going, well, we're putting a group G herbicide out every year, it's probably time to think about what else you can do. Yep. And I think uh, locally, and I appreciate we've got a nationwide audience here at the moment, um, the first two that come to mind are, are marshmallow and milk thistle because with the change of uh, tillage system, they've been favoured by no-till and they're tending to come up all year round. So there, there is uh, a greater risk of um, a certain population being exposed to group Gs yeah. you know, yeah. prior, prior to the lentil or the legume and then at uh, desiccation and then at summer. And yeah, it, yeah. it is a so risk. I think, I think in that, Chris, I'm be probably, based on their biology, be a little bit more concerned about sour thistle than I will about um, mallows, marshmallows, because, you know, only a small proportion of the seed bank of marshmallows come up at any one time. So, you know, it's coming up all year, but it's just a different bit of the seed bank. Um, so, you know, by the time you get to the end of the year, still only a fraction of that seed bank's actually emerged. A lot of it's going to emerge later. So that's going to actually slow resistance evolution. 
Uh, we've certainly received a couple of um, samples of um, mallows for group G testing and really haven't ever seen anything to get concerned about. Um, but South Essel is a different ball game because you know most of its um, seed bank will come up within a year. And so that, you know, if we're gonna be worried about a wheat, that's probably the one that for us here in the South, South Australia, I'd be focusing on. Yeah. Um, a question uh, from Twitter was about uh, group G's with camera spraying. Um, do you think that there's a fit there for them? Um, look, it's gonna be, it's gonna be a little bit problematic because part of the trouble we, and it, it depends on the product as to how we'll get a fit for there. But part of the trouble with group G's is a lot of them have got quite long residual. And when we're putting out camera sprays, we're actually putting out quite high rates. We're not doing the whole paddock, but we're co tending to concentrate that uh, on top of the weeds. And so that can lead us into issues with um, uh, crop safety. So I'm not really sure that most of these products would fit a camera spray. Um, a few that have, have very low um, residual um, might, but the rest of them, no, I don't think we want to go there. It'll, it'll be an interesting question for the, uh, the same presentation next Friday um, in the northern region, because there's a lot more uh, weed it's and weed seekers up in that neck of the woods. Um, yeah, plenty of, plenty of questions, Chris. So this is good. It's uh, developing a lot of discussion. Um, what post premium product would uh, you suggest can be used in lentils then, uh, if reflex can't be, for instance? Well, I mean, you know, we've got um, we've got metribuzin um, and those sort of products that we've we've traditionally had. Um, part of the trouble we're struggling with in lentils is that there are weeds we're not controlling, and um, you know, as you would know, Chris, you know, probably the big two here in South Australia are um, uh, South Isle and prickly lettuce. And it's because they become resistant to the imi herbicides that we're using. So I think that our answers, our, I mean, you know, reflex will, will help us in the in the lentil phase, but I really think our answers are actually fixing the rotation there. Um, I think the problem is that lentils have been too profitable for too long, um, and people have got really really tight rotations, and we see this across the country. Whenever you get really tight rotations it gets really hard to control certain weed species and, and resistance comes and bites you. So I, I really see that rather than going, well, you know, can we get another herbicide to slide into that space? I think we need to take a lateral view and go, what else can we grow that'll give us another chance of dealing with these weeds we're struggling with and allow us to, to get on top of them so we don't have so many germinating in our lentils? Because I think that's where the real problem is. We're getting these big populations coming up and so, you know, if, if you've got a big population, you know, a small percentage of weeds that come up in the row are a problem. If you've got a small population, you don't get very many weeds coming up in the row. So let's get the numbers down and then we won't have to worry about it. Yeah. Um, your, your thoughts and comments on um, the timing of, of year, like for application of group Gs, uh, why do they fail uh, in summer uh, quite a lot versus uh, autumn? Uh, oh, look, I think that that's really down to um, conditions and the fact that they're very contact products. Um, so, you know, in summer, it's it's hot. Um, you know, you're not actually um, going to have perhaps as much of that herbicide taken up into the plant um, because the droplets will dry faster. And um, so you just don't get the same um, concentration inside. And so you don't get the same level of, of, of movement. And you know, and then dusty conditions and all the other things that can that can cause us issues in summer. Um, and then, you know, there are some herbicides where with, and you know, glyphosate, I think it's a really good example of this, where under warm conditions, it works a bit too fast um, and actually doesn't kill the weed. And so I think that that's probably playing a bit of a role in, in that mix in the summer space. And we get a lot better uh, activity in the autumn space just simply because it's, it's not as hot and it's not as dry and conditions are better for the weeds growing. Yep. Uh, and what about the importance of um, adjuvant? Um, we, we know post emergent in crops, uh, it's basically a no, no because it heats them up too much and we get increased crop effects, but, what, what about uh, over summer and in the knockdown uh, stage? 
Yeah, look, um, for some of these products, um, you know, uh, adding adjuvants really helps them because, you know, say they're, they're, they're more contact leaf uptake products. Um, and, uh, you know, if it says put it in on the label, just put it in. Yep. Yep. Uh, a question again from coming from Twitter, uh, Chris. Um, do any Group Gs have activity on Mignonette? Uh, I don't know. Do you know, Chris? <laughs> I don't know that we've got a lot of Mignonette anymore, so we just almost never see it in our trials, but I'm sure you see more of it than I do. Yeah, quite quite a bit of it on the peninsula. And, uh, yeah, I, I would say with such a tap root and uh, the ability to reshoot, I would say you would see some really good knockdown, but very little control in the end. I think that uh, that's probably, yeah, that's probably what I would expect with a species like that. Uh, let me have a look. Uh, I've got a few here. Uh, what will be the criteria to go for IBS over post-O pre-E with uh, reflex in, in pulses? Um, where do you go for IBS if you're growing lentils? Um, so that's the number one. Uh, look, I think for the other pulses, it, the criteria is really going to be about um, what you're really trying to do with that um, herbicide. And, and certainly the PSPE application could make good sense because that does give you the opportunity to pick up a few of those weeds that might come up in the row. Um, so, you know, I, I, I suspect it'll, it'll come down to, do you want to have another pass over your crop? Uh, or do you want to put it all up front? Um, but it certainly with the other pulses, you do have that opportunity. And, you know, one of the things that we do know is that when we start putting some of these residual chemistries out in that space, and it's safe to put them out in that space, it gives us a little bit of length at the other end that can be valuable. Yep. Yep. No, and I'd, I'd back that up. Having done some uh, some trial work with uh, Varaxor, that, that was only when we compared it uh, against what we were conventionally using um, that the residual of the Varaxor was very good on the wild radish and the odd one that was coming up in the row was uh, not the problem that we thought it was when we compared it to what, what we'd normally been doing. Um, a question with Group G's uh, and glyphosinate or Amitrol. Um, yeah, look, there's been some um, really interesting um, work recently come out of the US with Group G's and, and glyphosinate um, that um, that I was actually a bit part of, so I've got a bit of a, an idea about what happened. And so um, the, uh, the, what the work showed was that some of the group Gs, um, some more so than others, but, but um, saflophenicil was a good example, were actually really quite synergistic with glufosinate. And it all boils down to what the two herbicides are doing. And it turns out there's a bit of a pathway that both of them share. And so if you can ratchet up that pathway by your group G, you could actually make the glyphosinate more effectively. Effective. The trouble was good on broadleaves and a number of broadleaves that, that were tested, um, but I've tried it on uh, ryegrass and, and barnyard grass. And um, well, I must admit, I've tried it with, uh, with, uh, uh, terrain on those and uh, and uh, and goal and it just doesn't do it. You just don't see the same um, type of synergy. So certainly group G's as an additive um, to glyphosinate, um, they do help. Um, but I think you're gonna you're not going to be able to get away with putting really low rates in and 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 hope to get grasses. You're probably going to be putting the the full rate in of your group G. Um, and you know again with Amitrol, I mean it, it, there's there's really no reason with those um, relatively slow acting um, herbicide products that we're going to have a problem um, with the group G's because really what we're relying on is to actually have enough herbicide taken up before the group G's have started to, to burn. And we don't, we don't see a problem um, with paraquat or glyphosate. So I don't see that we'd see a problem with those. And, and years ago, we did do a little bit of stuff on some um, glyphosate resistant ryegrass trying to do Amitrol plus group G's. And yeah, it made a bit of a difference. Yep. Um, what about weather conditions? Uh, are there certain weather conditions that are more favorable for application of group G's and getting them to work 
to their optimum? I think, again, think about them as their contact products. So having, um, you know, cooler, um, um, you know, better application conditions where your droplets are going to stay um, hydrated on the, on the leaf for longer, that would, that would work better. Um, so, you know, hot, dry conditions are always going to be a problem for herbicides. And we always need to find ways of, of making them work better under those circumstances. So um, those cooler conditions are better. These herbicides, um, their activity is actually driven by light. So you'll get faster um, effects under sunny conditions than you will if you've got a lot of cloud. Um, that doesn't mean that they're not working. Uh, it's just that they're not causing the damage as quickly. Yep. Oh, and I think the thing to remember, the contact herbicides, frost is bad. Yeah, <laughs> I can vouch for that, mate, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, and what about weed size, uh, Chris? Like generally taving uh, small weeds if, if possible? Being oh, look, I think, yeah, I think for the, um, you know, what we're trying to do with the pre sowing residuals, for example, is to charge the smallest weeds we've got um, just emerging. Again, they're mostly contact herbicides. So smaller weeds are better. Um, yep. And so, you know, yeah, trying to get, big, huge marshmallow with glyphosate and a spike. Well, it always takes forever for the marshmallow to die. Yep. Um, yeah, I, I think we're doing pretty well, uh, Chris. Like, there's probably uh, only one last one uh, here that I'll ask just before we hand back to Lisa. Um, can you help define why we get residual activity uh, out of the group Gs? Uh, is it simply putting more active uh, out in the paddock? Oh, look, that's a, that's a big part of what we're doing. <clears throat> so when we look at the, at the rates that we use these products at for residual activity, a whole lot higher than the rates we will use them at as a, as a spike. But then it depends a bit on the, on the chemistry we're dealing with. And um, so, you know, things that don't move very much, we're putting out really big rates. When we've got a bit of mobility, it's not so big a difference. So yeah, rates, one of it. Um, the other aspect to that is that, you know, the residual activity is about <clears throat> having the weeds come up through that surface. So, you know, when I talked about that surface seal um, that we, we traditionally thought about with things like um, um, gold and so on, um, you know, that high rate allows us to create that surface seal, which we couldn't do at a low rate. So, you know, yep. and, and, you know, the residual um, character, bigger rates mean it takes longer for them to break down. Very good. Uh, well, on behalf of the, uh, the Weed Smart team and, and those that have attended the uh, webinar, uh, thank you very much, Chris. So, uh, some personal thanks and uh, hand back to Lisa for a, uh, a wrap up. Cheers, mate. Thank you. Thank you, Chris and Chris Preston and Chris Davey. Sorry about that. It's hard to get both of you. Um, and thanks, everyone, for being a part of today's webinar. It's been a very informative webinar. I really have enjoyed it. Um, excuse me, we'll be running a second webinar next week addressing the same topic, however, with more relevance for those summer cropping areas. Andrew Somervale from Jubilee Consulting will join us along with WeedSmart Extension Specialist for the North, Paul McIntosh. Thanks everyone for being a participant today and a recording of this webinar will go live on the WeedSmart website next week. Thank you, everyone.